they have you try to mimic specific facial movements to test muscles or, or whatever. So you're doing all these ah, weird faces, and you don't realize it that when you get to the end of the exhibit, it's actually a two-way mirror, and there's a viewing room for everybody to sit there watching you make these horrendously disgusting faces. And then you see the reactions of everybody else, like the complete shock of the, someone who just came out of the shell just a little bit to try something brand new when they were doing the little facial expressions that they thought no one else was seeing, but only to find the horror of having like 50 people back there giggling and laughing and taking pictures. And it's, uh, that, was, that was pretty fun. I mean, that's really the only time I can think of the last time I've had a experience like that, except for like fun houses, but nowhere near as embarrassing or as funny as when you're sitting there thinking you're just doing something interesting, only to find out everybody else in the whole museum thought the same thing at the same time. So that would be my experience with a two-way mirror. Okay. And what was the sort, of, uh, the sort of thoughts racing through your head as you Well, you just have to go back to the, oh man, that kind of thing. And you can't really be irritated or angry because even if, let's say, you made a complete hash of the situation, you totally went all out and you embarrassed yourself, what does it matter? That was like 20 minutes ago when I was over at the other exhibit. So the idea of trying to be irritated or angry or frustrated or shy or whatever is irrelevant because you still have already, it's already happened. No amount of frustration, pain, anger is going to make any of those moments come back. You can't rewind time. You just have to go with it. So even if you're completely embarrassed, there's no point in trying to be irritated. You should just go with it. You know what? It's like, if I can do that, then hey, why not? Why can't I just come to an art museum on a Sunday when I'm be hanging out with my mom to talk to a thousand strangers? It's the same experience. It's just a matter of how you're perceiving the situation. So go for it. If you make it a little bit of a mess of yourself, why not? And do you find that this is a, um, really um, having the practice of being a Toastmaster uh, gives you sort of like ease in a situation like this? Or like the two-way mirror situation? Sure. Uh, and usually it's kind of different because you come with this with gifts already. You come with different liabilities and constraints. And really, when you're practicing, I mean, that's mostly the trick, is it gives you a venue for practicing what you already know. And I guess the hardest part about it is everyone can speak. Everyone can say exactly what they want to. Anyone has the gift of being able to persuade people with how they want to know what they're talking about. But few people exercise the power of speech. And it's the folks that decide, hey, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to go out there. Meet people I've never met before, people that I probably never ever meet out of any other circumstance, and just make it happen. I think that's the real benefit you get with Toastmasters, or even just any organization that you have to extend yourself just a little bit to try. I mean, it doesn't even have to be speaking, it could be anything. You could be taking an art class, but you suck at art. But you're still trying anyway, and who knows? As long as you keep doing it and going for it, eventually something's going to pop out and it'll just click, if that's what you really like. Because I mean, for me, I really love speaking. So the idea of getting out there and speaking in front of people is not really that, you know, it's not that nervous to me. It's just a matter of getting out there and doing it. And I think a lot of people are kind of like that in some way. As long as you give them a chance, give them a venue to attempt to try new things, you will be amazed at how they'll surprise you. So I think I'm going to move to the cue cards. Not really, but okay. I'm just going to roll. So we're going to try to do this again. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Well, I'll try to answer your question about the story of Echo and Narcissus. Speech is what takes place here right now. There's a mirror. I'm speaking. There's a camera. You pose a question. I repeat it. So I am acting as both Narcissus and Echo at one and at the same time. Echo arranges it so that it repeats the last syllables of the word of Narcissus. She speaks in such a way that the words become her own. In repeating the language of another, she signs her own love. In repeating, she responds to him. In repeating, this communicates with him. She speaks her own name, and just repeating his words, 
And as always with speech, one is blind. To speak is to not see. So all speech is to some extent blind. Echo blindly, but quite ludicrously <laughs> corresponds to Narcissus. Narcissus realizes that he can only see himself, that it's only his own image that is seen in the water. To see only oneself is a form of blindness. One sees nothing else. Farewell. together. <laughs> 